Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you. First and foremost, I'm sorry for the tardiness. Uh, you know, I, one of the things, I, I'm doing this tour in a lot of ways uh, to just basically deliver the class that I wish I had gotten while I was an undergrad at UVA. I had a lot of good classes there. I, I was not allowed into the one entrepreneurship class at UVA. I was sort of waitlisted, and then they insisted that I have to partner with other people who weren't my co-founder to start a company. And I was like, dude, I already created an LLC. Like, let me just do that for class. It's not hypothetical. Anyway, that didn't work out, and, and UVA really hates it when I tell that story. But the fact was, uh, the system just didn't quite work out um, for me. And I wanted to make I want to make sure that we find ways to inject this stuff as early as possible. Um, but a 77 stop or 77 university stop tour wouldn't happen uh, without a bunch of support from a bunch of amazing people. And then the 160 stop tour, which is what this is a part of, certainly would not happen without a help from a bunch of amazing people. So thank you guys all for coming out. Thank you, Scott, for organizing this. Thank you, Waffle House. Thank you, everyone. This is awesome. Um, you guys already heard my Waffle House anecdote. Um, the other thing that I go and tell these university students is how <laughs> I don't really know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, this is one of the things that I stress mostly because I think a lot of the times we get confronted with people who are in front of us, whether it's on stage or holding a microphone or on TV, and uh, we might assume that they've got it all figured out. And I am very clear and very quick to tell them, like, no, we're actually still figuring this shit out ourselves. And that life is not a paint by number. There are no instructions. There's no guidelines. You just figure it out as you go. And I think for a lot of them, uh, it, it, is, it is helpful to hear that as early as possible. I wanted to take my own advice, and when we planned this tour, um, because we had no idea what we were doing, we also had uh, a couple of amazing uh, people who were basically still in college, planning all this out, like organizing every stop, setting all this up. And one of them did not actually do the math for how long it would take to get from Blacksburg, Virginia to Atlanta, Georgia, which is roughly a six hour drive, um, which is what we did last night, which is why we are late. And I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, but we learn, we, we're learning as we go. And it, it's proof of the fact that, yeah, we don't quite know what we're doing. Our even our tour shirts even have a typo on them, which I didn't realize until like three weeks in. Um, these things happen, right? And that's the reality. Um, every one of us is, is always trying to figure this stuff out. And I think anyone, anytime someone comes before you and is like, I got it all figured out is either lying or delusional. And uh, I consistently find myself in a position where I feel a little over my head, um, but we make the best out of it. And so, well, why am I here? I'm here because I was at an event like a year ago and I'm bumming this guy. He's like, dude, you gotta come to Hypopotamus. And I was like, Hippopotamus? And he was like, no, Hypopotamus. And I was like, all right, all right. This sounds pretty cool. And I started learning some more. I'm like, all right, this is in, in many ways a part of a much larger movement that is across the country now of people getting excited about startups and creating communities and environments for them to thrive in. And I got into this game, I feel like at the uh, most ideal time because I had just graduated from college and I just stumbled into Y Combinator. Um, we were on our senior year spring break when we heard this guy named Paul Graham giving a talk called How to Start a Startup up in Boston. We were the only guys not going to the beach that spring break. And we went to Boston, he heard this guy give a talk and thought, yes, we love, this is it. We, this is, we, we were already thinking about doing a startup, but this was like, this was the thing. And a few weeks later, he announces Y Combinator. We applied with a very different idea, uh, a way to cut lines, basically order food from your cell phone instead of uh, waiting in line and then just show up and say, hey, that's me and pick it up. And we got rejected for it uh, from Y Combinator, which sucked. Uh, but the next morning, they called us back and said, you know what, we don't like your idea, okay? But we like you guys. And if you're willing to change your idea, we'll fund you. And we changed our idea there on the spot. We just, all right, well, we'll kill the old one, we'll figure out the new one. We, we took a train back to Boston, met with Paul Graham, who'd started YC, spoke for about an hour, and, uh, and what we came out of that was, let's build this front page of the internet. Um, that was Paul's wording, not ours. We just wanted to create a place to go where we could find out new stuff and maybe some cat photos. But when we launched, we, we really, it, it, it crystallized just how ignorant we were. I mean, we, we, we were three weeks into the program. We finally got something out the door. And I know Reddit will not win any design contests today, but it was pretty janky. It was actually even jankier 
uh, back then. But, but it was an important lesson because we realized, yeah, we were just some recent college graduates who had no idea what we were doing. But if we could create something of value, and it was, even in all, in all of its jankiness, we could get some traction, we could get some users who would start growing the site. And if you think about anything, right, anything you love, right, the first versions of it usually are pretty janky, right? Twitter, Facebook, any of those things. Even the first Iron Man. Remember the first Iron Man, right? That thing was janky, but it solved a real problem. And it, it, is, it is spaces like this and communities like this that encourage more and more people to be willing to put out that first version. And it's getting easier and easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper every day to launch and grow these things. So that's why it's so cool because I've traveled an extensive amount in general uh, around startups. In the last year, I did a documentary around the Silicon Prairie um, called, it was the Inter Silicon Prairie film. We're not very creative with our titles. It's a free to download, DRM free doc. We basically took a bus for eight days around the heartland. It was called the Internet 2012 bus because we wanted a campaign for the open internet and show everyone this internet economy is not limited to just Silicon Valley. Now, I'm, I'm a Brooklyn boy, so I'm a little biased. Um, but I do know after spending two years in San Francisco that as amazing as the, and the, look, the burritos are great, but as amazing as the Mexican food is there, um, you don't have to start a company in the valley. You don't have to start a company in the bay. And like I said, I, I have, I, it, it is, when you, when you see it smack you in the face in the middle of a farm in Richmond, Missouri, when you're talking to a multi-generational family farmer who's saying that like, and he's rocking the overalls, we're sitting and there's a bunch of cows wandering around and he's like, yeah, you know, I don't really check my email that often. I'm not like, I don't have a smartphone on me at all times and I'm playing Angry Birds. Like I have legitimate angry birds like chickens to deal with. Like, I don't have time for this. I check my email three times a week, but 90% of my orders now come through the internet. And you're just like, what? Nine zero? And he's like, yeah. Uh, and there's a, a startup called Ag Local, which is like a marketplace for meat. Uh, so it allows family farmers to basically compete on a level playing field with all those major agribusiness companies. And they can sell their meat to, you know, hungry individuals who just want great you know, well-raised meat, uh, or store owners, or restaurateurs, and they just go online. It just, it's cutting out a lot of the paperwork, a lot of the phone calls, a lot of the obnoxious stuff that a family farmer, or a, I mean, any full-time farmer just doesn't have time to do. And it's amazing because when you see it there, when you see it happening right there in front of you, having such a material impact on a family farmer's life, like one of the oldest industries in this country, in this world, you're thinking, holy shit, like maybe this internet thing really is having an impact. And what do you think a startup like that gets started? It doesn't get started uh, around a bunch of hipsters in the mission in San Francisco. No, it gets started in Kansas City because you better be talking to a ton of farmers if you want to build a product to serve their needs. And so going forward, it's an exciting time because we know software is eating the world, right? That's Mark Andreessen's right on about that. And we don't know how many ways it's gonna affect and change industries, but it's having such a dynamic impact and it's, a, and it's affecting so many different industries that the more of these startup communities we have, the better, because it's gonna mean more people solving distinct, unique problems with distinct, unique perspectives from, from distinct, unique places. And, uh, and so yeah, coming to places like this is, is, is extremely exciting. And like, my perspective ranges you know, from co-founding Reddit uh, today, it's, it's a top 50 website, you know, this, this pretty massive platform for online communities to share links, have discussions. Um, but three years ago, I helped Steve Huffman, who is my Reddit co-founder, launch another site, a travel search website called Hitmonk, uh, which is almost the exact opposite in that it's totally antisocial and our goal is to make you waste as little time as possible. And it's kind of like, I think it's paying penance for all the time wasted uh, because of Reddit. And, and it gave us a totally different perspective on creating something because this was really product driven, really UX driven, really design driven. And it came at another fortuitous time. More and more companies are winning these days just because they're solving a design problem that no one else seemed to care about, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, Hitmonk's just Gantt charts and a cute mascot. And a cute mascot alone is not gonna do it, even though I'm really proud of my mascot. Uh, the, 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 there is a change coming where design seems to have come up in the last few years as a way of just winning based on, on product. Like people actually are starting to care about the software you put in front of them and most of the software <laughs> that get, gets put in front of people kind of sucks. I'm, gonna, I'm even seeing startups now and through Y Combinator I advise you know, admitted like hundreds sort of within the network, but personally I've invested in about 80. So I mean I'm seeing a range of startups and even in, in the world of enterprise 
you're seeing founders win based on design because even enterprise clients are saying, damn, this actually is really great to use. This is actually an amazing user experience. And it's, it's, it's like I said, it's kind of an exciting time um, because we're also in one of the sectors, one of the few sectors that still can't hire enough people. Uh, that's also part of the reason I'm going to all these universities is because I ask them, how many of you are writing code? And because, I, for whatever reason, I tend to draw a lot of people who are learning how to write code, but there's always some non-trivial percentage who are not learning or don't know, and, uh, and I implore them. Like, even if they have no interest whatsoever in doing, even if they want to be history majors, um, it is worth doing because it is also freely available and extremely valuable. And anytime you do anything, right, repetitive, a robot can do it better. Um, but that's a big part of it too, right? We're in an industry right now that is growing, that has capital, that has like the ability to continue to drive the American economy forward. And I want to put a lot of pressure on you guys, but seriously, it's a big fucking deal. Uh, so let's not, let's not screw this up. And, uh, and the other thing, the other thing is that I think wherever, wherever this leads, and, and I, don't, I don't pretend to know exactly where it does, but wherever this leads, um, one of the things we learned from the fight against SOPA and PIPA is that we as citizens have amazing power that when organized, you know, we can exercise, right? This government is still ours, even though it sometimes doesn't feel like it. Um, but the internet does an amazing job to help us coordinate. And that was one particular venture against a couple of terrible bills funded by the entertainment industry. Um, but one of the things that I get excited by is, I mean, like I said, I'm talking to university students almost every day. And more and more of them are thinking of themselves as 21st century, uh, I don't know, like digital citizens. Um, they're thinking of their place in this world, not just as makers and not just as doers, but also as people who are passionate about, you know, making things work, um, who are passionate about actually having their, I don't have my phone on me. Um, <laughs> they're passionate about having their actual representatives on speed dial, so to speak. Uh, one of the coolest things I've seen is there's an app called Contact Congress, and it's, it's infiltrating the ranks of millennials. I know we're busy taking selfies most of the time, but when you consider that now it's as easy for us, it's actually easy, it takes fewer steps to call up your senator with this app or your representative with this app and just talk to a staffer than it does to choose, take a photo and choose a filter on Instagram. All right, because sometimes it's really hard to choose which filter you want because you know, there's a couple that kind of look good. Um, but that's exciting for me because if we can make that process as, as sort of straightforward and obvious as possible, we're going to get a lot more engaged citizens uh, who are feeling as entitled about, you know, having a government that represents them as they do, you know, seeing photos of random strangers breakfast. Um, but anyway, I want to tell you, it's been, it has been an amazing sort of month and a half in so far, and I'm going to be doing this until March. But I'm, I'm spreading the word. I'm spreading the word about learning how to code. I'm spreading the word about getting stuff done and getting people into the process of having ideas and doing them. Um, but the reason I'd say most of y'all here is because you're either doing a startup, really thinking about doing a startup, or in a large company and want to do entrepreneurial stuff. Um, so I don't need to convince you guys about the virtues of this. I want to help as much as I can. And if at all possible, leave you with one of probably my favorite anecdotes of what the future of this whole internet means. Um, and it is this. Uh, there is a really big water cooler now. Imagine a ginormous one. And when we started in 05, social media was not a phrase. There was no water cooler of that scale. We still just had word of mouth, which was always very powerful, uh, limited to physical space, right? You can only have those conversations with people who are around you. And in the last eight years, the thing that has blown my mind is how much of a difference now this word of mouth can make at scale and with speed that we've never seen before. And I see this giant Twitter bird in the background, so I know I'm in the right. That is a Twitter bird, I presume, right? Kind of? All right. Twitter inspired, because that is an interesting species of bird if that is not the Twitter bird. But we, we, we all know firsthand what impact it's made, and one of my favorite anecdotes about that, and one of the reasons why you have to be great at whatever it is you are doing, whether it's making a product, whether it's developing a nonprofit, whether it's writing a blog or taking photos, the reason you have to be so great is because word of mouth spreads faster and further than ever before. And for the first time, we can actually see firsthand what people actually think about the stuff we are doing. Imagine this, for all of business, for all of history, like we never had that kind of real-time feedback at that kind of scale before. And so it was always a lot easier to just take PR and whitewash everything. It was a lot easier to just sort of ignore and avoid. But for anyone coming up now, you are getting a 24-7 feedback loop.
And that's great if you are passionate about what you're doing, if you're working hard and genuinely trying to solve problems. It's kind of tough if you've been delivering a shitty product or a shitty service because people are gonna talk about it. And, and this new world actually represents an amazing opportunity for the people who are doing great stuff. A, a less amazing opportunity for those who aren't. But you know what, I think that's probably better for the ecosystem. Um, and one of my favorite ways of illustrating this would have to be uh, a note. Uh, it was a letter, a form letter from the IRS. All right, so imagine the most stodgy, this is probably one of the least, we can agree, probably least liked organization in the United States, right? It's probably up there. And so the IRS uh, sent this letter out. It's one of these sort of generic bureaucratic form letters, blah, 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 IRS form letter. And then there was this paragraph that basically said, look, we're really sorry. We totally understand what happens uh, and your uh, explanation of your lateness on your taxes that, quote, you know, a, a parent, a new parent's brain turns to mush the first few months after having a baby, end quote, was a valid reason for you being late. So we are going to hereby refund $2,500 in late fees. And so you're looking at this and you're just like, what? Like amidst all of this, all of this bureaucracy, all of this nonsense, here's a moment of humanity from some random person who worked at the IRS, was willing and able to say, you know what, here, take your $2,500 back. You just had kids. Like, Clearly, you know, you, you were late, but you had the best of intentions. You just, your brain was mush, because I guess that's what happens when you have kids for the first few months. And what's wild about that is, okay, so that's one, that's one small anecdote. And like I said, 10 years ago, that story is the Christmas dinner story, right? It's a Thanksgiving dinner story. They probably tell it every Thanksgiving for at least a few years. Um, it's probably makes its rounds around the bowling league or maybe around the office, but it doesn't go too much further. How the hell do I know this story? It's not because I know these people. It's because it front paged on, I think it was our picks. It's one of the subreddits. And then of course it went viral, Twitter, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Millions of people saw this, this photo because one person who had a story, a very honest story uh, that would have reached a few people was able to reach literally millions just by taking a photo and putting it online. Now what's crazy about this is think of all the positive goodwill that that generated for the IRS, one of the most loathsome organizations in the country. Like they could have spent millions of dollars on a PR campaign that would have not had a fraction of the impact. You might like, like the, the Super Bowl ads of like, uh, the IRS loves you, you know, <laughs> see you April 15th. Like there's just no, the, nothing would have worked. And yet one person for $2,500 is able to have such a big impact on the way people perceive that organization. And, uh, and that's pretty cool because if the IRS can do it, like why can't we? And, and I, always, I, I always keep that in mind uh, because it's a glimpse of the potential. And then when I think about the status quo right now, I think about, uh, you guys read, everyone read Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness. The, the TLDR on it is basically, he's the Zappos founder. The TLDR is basically uh, treat your customers really well. And, and what's wild is this book was received by CEOs across the world as being revolutionary. Like, think about that. The status quo when a bunch of CEOs are like, Johnson, this is brilliant. <laughs> we could treat customers well. Oh, what have we been thinking? Like, that's, that's a sign of just how screwed up the situation is when, when, when that is revolutionary. But that's, that's where we're at. And in most of the cases, in most of the industries, people have gone so far away from the people they are serving, whether they are customers, whether they are voters, whether they are fans, whether they're whatever, that uh, it's a tremendous opportunity. And, uh, and again, I hope you guys all make amazing stuff. Because if we get this right, I really do believe it's gonna mean better businesses, better nonprofits, uh, uh, better art, better entertainment, even, and I think even better politicians. Um, but uh, it's up to us to actually build that future.